Hello, and welcome to 3.4 Rotating Frames of Reference. This is our very last lesson for Unit 1, and it's really kind of culminating what we've learned about um, different frames of reference, relative motion, and of course circular motion, which we're focusing on in this chapter. So here we're talking about how we can do measurements when we're in a frame of reference that is rotating. So if I'm for instance, um, on a merry-go-round, and let's say I'm, I'm just looking from above here, but I'm, I'm on a merry-go-round which is going around in a circle like this, so I'm, now I'm over here and then over here and over here, my perspective is changing in this rotating frame. Now of course I'm rotating so I'm accelerating, that means it's non-inertial. So the question is, how can I do calculations in that sort of a frame? And one thing you can think about is the fact that actually we are already on a rotating frame because we're all on the Earth. So right now our frame is slightly rotating. It's very small so we don't need to worry about it very much, but it does actually affect some of our calculations when we look at weather patterns, for instance. So, without any further ado, let's take a look at this. The first term we're going to deal with is the word centrifuge. So a centrifuge is a rapidly rotating device used to separate substances and simulate gravity. Simulate gravity. So that's a centrifuge. It's something that spins really fast. And generally it will spin an object very fast in a circle. And so we've learned about the centripetal force. This is the force that we looked at in the last lesson. And this always acts inwards. Always acts inwards to cause centripetal acceleration. And the other thing I'm going to say is that it is real. It's a real force, which means it's not fictitious. And remember, in 3.1 we were talking about fictitious forces. So centripetal force is a real force that is caused by something. It's caused by a rope, or it's caused by gravity, whatever it's caused by. Now we also have a, a type of force called a centrifugal force. A centrifugal force. And this force is fictitious. It's not real. It doesn't exist. It only exists to help us explain what's happening when we're in a rotating frame of reference. When I'm in this non-inertial rotating frame, the only way I can explain what's happening is by using this fictitious force that I've just made up called centrifugal force. That doesn't mean that it's not useful. Just because we made it up doesn't mean it's not useful. It acts opposite opposite the centripetal force which means it acts outwards. And the centrifugal force, it's what we feel. When we're in some rotating frame, centrifugal force is the force that we feel. Even though it doesn't exist, it's what we feel when we're on that, on that uh, rotation. So, as an example, this is a centrifuge used by astronauts. It spins around in a, in a big circle really, really, really fast, and you can see that we have a person sort of sitting in this chamber over here, and the idea is that as it spins, they end up experiencing a force outwards. Remember, this isn't a, isn't a real force, but this is the force they think they feel. 
That's our centrifugal force, and it feels like gravity. So if we spin them faster, it'll feel like they, you know, then we can simulate, well, instead of just having regular gravity, we can simulate twice gravity, or we can say three times gravity, so they can get an idea of what it'll feel like in different conditions on their, on their journey. And so this is used to train astronauts. And another sort of centrifuge is this one here. This is used to um, process things like blood. When we have blood, we need to separate different pieces of it. And the way we do that is by spinning them around in a circle really, really fast, which simulates gravity again, because these test tubes will feel some artificial force towards the outside that will cause them to actually separate. So the heavier particles will fall more down, and the lighter particles will be left further up, and it actually separates these particles. So this fictitious force still accomplishes a very real uh, end result. So those are some examples of centrifuges. Excellent. So um, here's one last example. This is what I was describing of, um, of sort of a merry-go-round. So if we're looking at some passenger on a merry-go-round from above, well, I'm spinning around in a circle. My instantaneous velocity is that direction, but I'm being forced inwards like this. So from somebody's perspective off of the ride, this is what's happening. And the rail, whatever the ride I'm on, is just forcing me inwards like this. But from my perspective, well, my perspective, I'm not moving at all over here. My perspective. Um, all my forces are balanced. So I've got a force inwards, and I've also got a force backwards, outwards. And that's the force that I feel. I feel like I'm being pushed up against the back of my seat. And that is the centrifugal force. Okay, and so here's um, one last picture here. This is a free body diagram. So you can see we have, uh, now from the side, we have gravity downwards, normal force upwards. Inwards we have our... Um, centrifugal, or sorry, our centripetal force, and outwards is our fictitious centrifugal force. Cool. So we're going to be doing a problem with these on the next page, but mostly this, this lesson is about the idea of centrifugal force. So you can see over here there's a picture of blood that has been separated using a centrifuge. So we simulated a whole bunch of extra gravity, let's say 10 times regular gravity, so that this heavier part of the blood will separate downwards, whereas all this lighter part stays at the top. And that's really useful for being able to do the then tests on the blood. So, we're going to talk a bit. I'm just going to give you some information here about centrifuges and test tubes. So as I've been saying, dense particles settle to the bottom, because of the centrifugal force. So even though it's a fictitious force, it does actually cause things to happen. Now, if we wanted to explain it without using fictitious forces, we could say, well, or inertia. That's really sort of what's happening, is that in this picture above, this test tube, you can see if I had a particle here, well, its instantaneous velocity is this direction, so it means it's going to want to keep on moving in that direction, and you can see that that's going to force it not just over, but also downwards. And so you see that we, we um, the particle wants to wants to move downwards this way. You can see that that's what this picture is trying to show, that it goes from A to B. And so the heavier it is, the more it wants to do that, and that's what separates the heavier from the, heavier meaning denser, the denser uh, substances. Great. So, how about this point? Centrifugal force and Earth's surface. Well, we experience the central centrifugal force on Earth, and it has a very real effect. The first effect that we can say is that um, we are lighter 
at the equator by 0.34% because because of the centrifugal because of centrifugal force and so um, if you were to host the Olympics at the equator and this has happened before if you host the Olympics closer to the equator people are actually going to perform better things like high jump they'll get much better results because they actually people weigh less because of the centrifugal force, because the Earth is spinning around in a circle. And um, the other effect that the centrifugal force has is that it also squishes the Earth at the top and bottom. And what I mean is that if you look at the Earth it's actually sort of, I mean this is a huge exaggeration here, but it's wider at the center than it is at the, um, than it is from top to bottom. So this, this here would be the equator. It's wider there because we're spinning around in a circle and the centrifugal force is pulling things outwards. Okay, and one other effect that it has is the Coriolis force. And this is a fictitious force that I'm just going to say that affects weather, weather patterns. And if you're more interested in that, there's a better description in your textbook or you can look it up online. The Cori Coriolis force is very interesting and it causes these sort of swirly formations that you can see when you have weather forecasts. It causes the clouds to sort of have that, that path. All right, on page two. This is the last little bit of unit one. We can use the centrifugal force to create artificial gravity. So on spacecrafts, we have something called extended freefall. And the idea is that if I have the Earth here and I have some spacecraft orbiting the Earth, well, if it's following this path that's just going around the Earth perfectly orbiting, then all of that centri uh, centripetal force is being used to cause that orbit, which means that there's no actual normal force pushing back up on people in that spacecraft, which means that they actually feel weightless. So that's what this is. It's, we can simulate weightlessness by free falling and that's what um, for instance the International Space Station is doing it's constantly free falling towards the earth but it just means that it stays in a perfect orbit alright and what we can say about that is it is unhealthy because our bodies aren't used to weightlessness. So if you're on the spacecraft for many months or years, then it's going to have very negative effects on your body. So it might be useful on these spacecrafts to actually try to simulate gravity so that we're no longer weightless so that we can actually have some extra gravity. And we can do that, this artificial gravity here, the idea is that we simulate a gravitational force for instance by using a rotating reference frame.
And again, even though it's a fictitious force, it is the force that we feel. So if I'm on this space spacecraft and I'm creating this centrifugal force, well, it's going to feel like I have weight. So we'll take a look at, at the example here. This is a spacecraft that's rotating to create artificial gravity. You can see that um, it's, so it's rotating around like this. That means that we have centripetal force inwards. And from the astronaut's perspective, they also have centrifugal force downwards, which is just like gravity. And you can see that um, my astronauts here are standing on the inside. So this is the ground for them, which is kind of funny. So if they walk around, if they walk far enough, well, they will just end up where they started. They just keep on walking forwards, and they'll end up where they started. Um, and so you've, you've probably seen this in some sci-fi movies. They uh, like to use this idea in lots of different movies. Okay, so we're going to consider a rotating space station similar to the one on the right. The radius of the station is 40 meters. How many times per minute must the space station rotate to produce a force due to artificial gravity equal to 30% of Earth's gravity? Okay, well, it says we want 30% of Earth's gravity. We want there to be a normal force. Remember, normal force is my apparent weight. So I want a normal force pushing up on me of 0 0.3 of the force of gravity. So this is 0 0.3 mg. That's what, what I want my normal force to be. Now, you see that my normal force, this is the thing that's pushing me upwards. It's pushing me in a circle towards the center. So that's to say that my normal force is my centripetal force. So in this case, I'm using normal force to give me acceleration inwards. All right, and now we have an equation for that. We're asked how many times per minute. So we're asked for a frequency measure. So I'm going to use my equation. m times 4 pi squared r f squared. So now I have normal force equals this. So I can say here, 0 0.3 mg is equal to m times 4 pi squared r f squared. And the m's cancel out. This gives me now, to solve for f, I can say f squared is equal to 0 0.3 g over 4 pi squared r. f is equal to the square root of that. And I'll fill in my numbers at the same time here. So we have 0 0.3 times 9.8 divided by 4 pi squared times r. r in this case was 40 meters. This gives me 0 0.043 hertz. So in each second, it needs to go around 0 0.043 times. Now remember, it said how many times per minute? So I'm just going to convert that here. So I'm going to divide this by, or multiply this by, 60 seconds in one minute. This is going to give me, um, well, this is going to give me a, a frequency of 2.59 revolutions per minute. That's RPM stands for revolutions per minute. And if you're not sure how I went from Hertz to RPM, well, please do ask me in class. But there we go. There's our final answer. And I've used the same number of significant digits. So we're good to go. That's our final answer. So that was the problem. That's the final lesson of Unit 1. And um, I wish you good luck on the test. And I'll see you in the next lesson.